So hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Now today, Pogaccia, today we're going to look at Pogaccia's bike fit, equipment choices, Team UAE in general, and why I think he's one of the most dynamic bike riders in the peloton, not just because of his genetic freak nature of his watts per kilo, but I think he's very dynamic in, in his approach to his bike setup. And I've said this before, and I'm going into this in a video coming up soon, that equipment throughout all the pro teams is very, very similar. Yeah, there are different brands, different group sets, different tires, but at the top level, there's so little to choose between the equipment. And it really does come down to set up the performance engineer on that team and how they make use of that equipment in terms of, you know, what's per CDA and bike fit and stuff like that. Anyway, let's, before we dive into the tech, let's look at Pogaccia's actual bike fit because he's a very dynamic rider. Like I said, a lot of riders in the peloton seem very stuck in their ways about bike fit and changing things, particularly the old school. Let's not forget when Pogaccia came into the peloton, he was riding with, he was riding with riders like Nibali and Valverde, 42 centimeter bars, and he's got shoulders 36 centimeters across. Anyway, I digress. So let's look at Pogaccia's bike fit. He's not afraid to change his bike fit season to season, you know, he's a young rider. When I was his age, I was changing my bike fit, trying to find the right position. And he's not afraid to change it month to month as well. And I really like him because he's kind of a horses for courses type thinker. And he, you know, will set the bike up depending on the course and depending on how he wants to win. So whereas other riders might just have one bike fit year on year for every type of course, whether it's a flat UAE tour or a tour of Flanders. So Pogaccio will set his bike up depending on the demands of the course. Now, I would say he's got one of the most forward bias positions in the whole peloton. What do I mean by that? Well, his center of mass or center of gravity, whatever you want to call it, is very, very far forward. And that's enabled by a very long stem, which is kind of de rigueur in the peloton. But he's got his saddle now, as of like this year, slammed all the way forward on the rails, a very steep seat tube angle on the bike, and it's nose down as well. And I've kind of been a ambassador for the nose down saddle for for years, and not just because I got a massive drop from my saddle to my handlebars, because I'm a big guy, and that's just how we have to deal with frames, but it enables you to be comfortable when the bike is going uphill. So when you go to your bike fitter and they'll set you up on the flat in the studio on a retail bike or a stationary bike on a Wahoo or whatever, all your bike fitting is done on the flat. But let's be fair, most bike races are won and lost on climbs in you know GCs and down to amateur level in sportives. We exert ourselves on the climbs, it's where people put their power out and it's where you want your biomechanics to really work. And I think, I think Pogac has thought about that more than other riders in the peloton, because if you look at this bike here from Tour of Flanders, he's got everything slammed forward. He's got his center of mass way in front of the bottom bracket. I think he knows that he needs to set that bike up for where he wants to win. So by setting the nose of the saddle down and pre-rotating his position, when his bike is on a 10% or a 20% gradient, which is roughly six and 11 degrees respectively of incline, his saddle relative to his gravity vector, which never changes, that's always pointing down, is now in a neutral position, it's now flat. Whereas if he was to set his saddle up in a flat position from the gun, as soon as you go onto an incline, your gravity vector doesn't change, that's still pointing down. That saddle is now inclined into your gooch and it gets uncomfortable. It's not a stable platform for pedaling. You have to rotate your hips back to alleviate the soft pressure. I mean, everyone will do this. You don't know you're doing it, but you will have to. Now the bike fitter will say, even a good one will say, oh, I should never put your saddle nose down because you'll slip forward. Well, that just doesn't happen for a couple of reasons. You'll end up pushing a little bit further back with your hands. So you, there is an increased sort of aft force that you'll supply with your hands to stop that. And also the fact that on pro, at pro level, they're pushing so damn hard on the pedals, very little weight is actually reacted on the saddle at all. Similarly, the bike fitter will always say, I oh, should never have your saddle nose up. They'll laugh at you if you go into a bike fit studio with your saddle nose up. And you can say to them, well, if you set that level, when I'm riding up hills, which is, you know, as cyclists, what we overcome is what we love doing is climbing. That saddle relatively to my gravity vector, my weight, the weight that I feel on the saddle is now inclined. So I've been a, you know, an ambassador for the, the nose down saddle for ages because I just think when you get to a climb and you're doing your FTP test you know even if it's a five percent climb you want to have your saddle two to three degrees nose down and I don't think enough riders in the peloton are following that because you see Pogaccio when he's going up a climb he's really upright he's very open in the torso his hip angle is very open he's got a nice big bend in his elbows and he's not having to crane his whole body over and close his hip to try and get weight over the bottom bracket 
you see some of the older school riders and even some of the younger riders who just think like a long stretched out position is better but they're so far back over the rear wheel they're having to bend their hips straight forward like that to try and get some weight over the bb and it just looks ungainly i mean i'm not taking it away from you know their athletic performance like all pros are outrageous athletes but i just think he just looks so much more comfortable in the saddle he doesn't have to scoot forward and sit on the nose of the saddle like a lot of other riders will do to mimic his position. He has set his position up pre-rotated to suit the places where he wants to put the power out and suit where he's going to win. He will change his bike fit depending on the course. Like I said, if you look at his bike fits from flat races, the saddle is more leveled out because he's spending more time on the flat. So he doesn't need to do that pre-rotated position. But then if you come to something like the Tour of Flanders where he's going to be attacking on 20% gradients, he's really got a heavy tilt on the nose down of the saddle. I think UAE in general have come on, come on leaps and bounds with their kit and equipment choices. They're now on Envy. Some say that's a downstep from the Campagnola wheels. I think it's a good thing because it also enables them to ride Envy cockpits, which are just normal bars and stem. And you see Pogaccio riding some of the narrowest bars in the peloton. I mean, like I said before, if you look at some of the older school riders that are super skinny, I'll drop in a couple of pictures here of like Nibbly and Dylan Turns or something. You know, 36 centimetre shoulders riding bars that are like 42, eight. riding bars that are sort of 42, 44 centimetres across, just throwing away what? Maybe on a watts per kilo on their good day is, is equal, but watts per CDA and you forget it. Like I said, by riding that MV equipment, um, some of the narrowest bars that you can buy commercially sold by MV, and those ones I actually really like because they're flared out the drop so when you are descending and you do want a bit more control with a wider bar the drops are flared out but in your sort of general riding on the hoods position he's very very narrow at the front and very comfortable and he's actually gone away from using i think the integrated conargo one piece bar and stem which i think was made by data in it in favor of the NV system which is just a separate bar and stem and i think a lot of the team riders have done that they've got an upgrade now they're on uh, conti conti tires i think they've gone away from using pirelli there's a slight wattage gain in there from people in the know. The Conti 5K TR, one of the fastest tyres. It's a smidge slower than the Corsa Pro or the Corsa Speed. That one or two watts at you know 40 k's an hour in terms of rolling resistance, it makes up for itself in, in just durability. In my experience of Corsa Speeds is that they're so fragile and they just don't last very long. I think your punch protection in the Conti is much better um, by default. So I think there's an upgrade there. Some people have said that the Shimano is a big upgrade on the bike. I think actually Campagnolo drivetrains are really good. The chains are made by YBN. They're some of the highest efficiency tested chains in the business. The steel was very good grade hard steel. Um, and I think Campi and Shimano are on a par when it comes to chains and drivetrain uh, efficiency. Now I do think there is a slight gain just in terms of inventory with Shimano, like they've got a bigger, wider range of kit available to use on the TT bikes and stuff, but the downside is the power meters. The power meters just don't work. If I was a pro and I, you know, that's my, that's how I earn my living is keeping, up, keeping an eye on my power and performing to power, I wouldn't be happy on a Shimano power meter and I'd definitely be fitting a four eyes left sided crank arm on the other side, cheeky little four eyes, I don't think, uh, well, Put it like this i think a lot of them are doing that uh that are, you know shimano sponsored teams so i actually came out to film this video yesterday uh, i've been waiting all week for for the weekend and some nice weather after quite a long work week and i nearly got taken out by a van the external microphone that i used to record the audio nice and crisp didn't record and then i started to edit the video and found all that out late at night so yesterday was a bloody waste of time this is what i love and hate making youtube videos and uh, so I'm back out today. It's not sunny, it's cold. I'm doing it all again. So I hope I've re rehearsed it and probably made it a bit more concise than yesterday, but that is the, that's the YouTuber, that's the YouTuber problems. So I'll put in some graphics about the pre-rotated position. I hope you can understand that. And the, the important thing is, is that the gravity vector, what I call the gravity vector, but it's the force that you feel as weight. Whether you're on an inclined slope or on a flat road, it doesn't change. So. I know in mountain biking there is actually a device which you can change the saddle angle on the fly to, to mitigate this. So when you're climbing up really steep stuff, you can level the saddle to, to, to still be perpendicular to the gravity vector, which is going to take a whole load off the soft tissues like down there, the crown jewels, 
And I don't know, do I predict in the future that bikes will have some sort of like leveling system, like some rider based gimbal, so you as the engine always stay kind of level uh, or perpendicular to, to gravity? Maybe, I think it's more comfortable. If you take it to the extremes and you're riding up a vertical slope, you know, like if you don't level your position out, you're basically pushing yourself off the bike. <laughs> I know that's a very extreme scenario, but I do think, you know, being forward biased. It does load the quads. Ironically, if you're not riding hilly terrain, ignore this video. Just leave the saddle flat, leave your center of mass further back. But if you're really going for hilly races, oat route, something like that, hilly sportives, think about that forward bias position. It's gonna make you more comfortable climbing. It's gonna help you put the power out. So I'm on one of my zone one rides this week. So uh, I'm just cruising. Thanks to all the patrons again. Thanks for supporting me over there. And don't forget, if you don't want to join the Patreon community, where there's some slightly more kind of exclusive content, just clicking subscribe is enough. Um, I know a lot of you that watch this channel aren't subscribers and it would really help expand the reach and you know expand the, the kit reviews that I can do that help me talk to the brands with a bit more clout. So please do um, click subscribe. If you like, I'll leave it up to you. Cheers and I'll see you in the next one.